uh, with NDI in more than 30 countries. And he's previously been a consultant to the UN and US aid on human rights and rule of law issues. And he was also a senior fellow at DePaul, University's College, DePaul University College of Law's uh, International Human Rights Law Institute. And our second speaker will be Arif Rafiq, who is an adjunct scholar with the Middle East Institute, um, where he conducts research on the reform of national security policy making in Pakistan. He's also president of Vizier Consulting, which provides uh, political risk analysis on South Asia and also the Middle East. He previously worked at the Brookings Institution and at several uh, public relations firms. And uh, he's a contributor to a variety of print and web publications, including uh, Foreign Policy and Christian Science Monitor. So we'll hear from Peter first, and then Arif, and then we should have uh, a good amount of time for Q&A. So Peter, why don't you start things off? Thank you. Can you all hear me? Great. Um, th well, thank you very much, Michael. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, I've made several trips to Pakistan over the last few years, really. And um, I mean, I've been going there since 1990, actually. So my involvement in Pakistan is about 23 years now. Um, NDI has been involved in Pakistan programmatically since 1988. Um, but during the, the past year or two, um, every trip that I took uh, was one in which the government was in some sort of crisis. Everyone was predicting that the government would soon fall and that Zadari just couldn't last. Um, events have obviously proved otherwise. And, you know, as Michael noted, this is a historic occasion in that the government is the first, I guess, since uh, the first Bhutto government that's completing its uh, full term. And the country's poised to uh, be the, the, the it's going to be the first time, it could be the first time in the, in the nation's uh, history that one elected government is going to transfer power through a credible election process to another. Of course, that's the subject of our, our discussion, I guess, as to whether it will, in fact, be a, a credible election process. Um, in, in pursuit of determining whether it, it would be, um, NDI sent a pre-election uh, delegation to Pakistan in December. It was in addition to, to me. It included Joe Clark, uh, a former prime minister of Canada, Xenia Dormandy, who is now at Chatham House but used to be at the State Department and the U.S. State Department at the National Security Council, and Nurse Anita Nasution, who's a former uh, member of parliament from Indonesia and a, a human rights and women's uh, uh, empowerment activist. Um, and the delegation was actually part of a larger election project that NDI is undertaking to review every aspect of the election process. Um, we plan on election day, for example, to deploy about 45 observers um, that will be in every province of, of the country. Um, there'll be long-term observers that will be deployed by our, our partner in this undertaking, which is ANFREL, uh, a regional election observer body. Um, and so the plan is to uh, be looking at the campaign period, election day, the counting process, and um, the complaints process. Um, the EU, I know, is also planning to deploy a delegation, I think, uh, of 114 people. Um, and uh, Fafin's going to be, the domestic election observer body, is going to be um, deploying, I think, 43,000 monitors. That's what they're, they're predicting. Um, so they should be able to cover together, uh, we all should be able to cover most of the 80,000 polling stations in the country. Um, in the delegation, I, I think, was uh, the, our December delegation was you know, mindful of uh, the, 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 the notion that saying anything positive about Pakistan would expose us to public ridicule. Uh, 
nevertheless, I, we did see a number of positive developments. Um, the, the passage of the 18th and 19th and 20th Amendments um, it strengthened the, the powers of Parliament, decreased those of the President, and uh, helped secure the, the independence of the Election Commission. Um, uh, perhaps most strikingly for us, the, the, we, we saw an unprecedented, unprecedented level of collaboration among the political parties, actually reflected in, in the passage of those amendments, um, but also uh, in, in, in other ways, uh, in the selection of the chief election commissioner. Um, also in the NDI hosted a series of roundtables in which the political parties commented on a proposed code of conduct by the election commission. The parties actually agreed to sort of a common set of recommendations uh, that they uh, proposed to the election commission for, for changes in the, in the code of conduct. There's been a multi-party parliamentary committee looking at election reform um, and hearing recommendations made by the political parties and civil society organizations. It's a new spirit of, of cooperation, I think, and, and coupled with the explosion of the, uh, the news media that we've seen since early in the Musharraf days, since uh, 2002, um, and a, a new assertive and independent uh, judiciary, I think it's created a, a sense of optimism among many of the people, uh, certainly those that, that we talked to, that um, the reforms that have been uh, initiated since 2008 might continue. There are serious problems as well. Um, violence is probably the, the, the key one, um, and it's occurring, I think, on an unprecedented scale. You know, in all the elections in Pakistan, there's always been no-go areas. These are areas in which a party or parties and or particular candidates don't feel uh, that they could safely campaign. But they were always kind of limited in, in number and um, uh, concentrated in, in, a, in a few key areas. Um, I, I think what we're seeing today is something that's uh, uh, far, far more extensive than that. Um, in addition to FATA, where you expect the problem, it, it, certainly in uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and, and Balochistan, uh, there is broad territories, uh, swaths of, of territory that um, are unsafe to, to campaign in. Um, in. In the KPP, obviously, the Awami League is, uh, the Awami National Party, rather, is the, um, the, the key target for, for much, of the, uh, much of the violence. We, we talked to a number of people that told us about how they had to campaign, which was house to house or um, uh, g gatherings of, uh, of small groups of people um, focusing really on, on, on getting their supporters out rather than, than reaching new, new voters. There's no open rallies, there's no processions in the streets, um, and how that's gonna affect uh, the, the election it itself is unclear at this point. Um, in Balochistan, you have the, this uh, complicated admixture of, of um, military suppression, uh, insurgent activity, sectarian violence, uh, activity on the part of, of the Taliban, um, and uh, there's large parts of, the, of that province that I, I think are going to be quite, quite unsafe. And it, I mean, it's interesting when you talk to the people that have been uh, the victims of, of, of the violence or, or parties, uh, the, their party has been, been the victim, the, the, the target of the violence. That they, they oftentimes cannot identify the perpetrator and they even stop trying. Um, there's so much violence going on that no one can actually tell uh, what the source really is. Um, we now saw the uh, a district election commissioner killed the other day. Um, no one has identified the, the perpetrator of, of, of that incident as well. Th that struck me as being quite sort of a dangerous development. You know, up until now, it seemed that, unlike Afghanistan, where there are many attempts to derail the electoral process, in Pakistan, the, the perpetrators of the violence usually had 
a, can a preferred candidate in the race. They didn't really want to upset the electoral process itself. They just wanted to intimidate their political opponents. Uh, but when the election commission's a target, it sends a, a slightly different signal. Um, it may be an isolated incident, and there's so many different actors involved in, um, in, in perpetrating this kind of violence that uh, it, it's difficult to determine whether that's a, a, a trend or not. Um, but I guess we'll see in the, in the coming weeks. In Karachi and Hyderabad, there's obviously uh, sectarian violence and also disputes between uh, the, the MQM and uh, the Pashtun community um, in their competition for political power. Um, and uh, there were a, a number of different discussions about how this was going to be addressed as the, the campaign approached. We talked to the election commission about it. They said that they were developing a district by district plan with the military to provide security on election day. Uh, but as far as I can tell, no such plan has actually been developed. Um, another serious problem is that of women uh, and their barriers to political participation. You know, the estimated uh, 10 million eligible women who are not even on the voters roll and uh, those that are um, still face uh, a number of different obstacles. We, we saw in 2008 and more recently in, in last year's by-elections that uh, at the local level at least there were conspiracies to prevent women from voting were by political parties, including uh, secular parties like the, the PPP would make agreements with local officials um, to prevent women polling stations from, from opening. Um, the election commission was well aware of the problem, uh, has the power actually to nullify those elections and, and uh, order repolling, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, but, but did not do so. Uh, the election commission did support a proposal to uh, have a, a threshold of 10% of uh, to cancel any election in which less than 10% of the registered women did not vote. Um, that was presented to Parliament, which uh, did not adopt it. Um, so we're going to see. I mean, so the question really is, is the Election Commission serious about enforcing uh, the law with respect to, to women voting? Um, and it, it's not just Khyber Pachunkwa or Fata, in which this is a problem, it's really uh, extends throughout the country. We've seen it in the rural Punjab, we've seen it in the Sindh. Um, voter registration was a, another key issue. There's widespread agreement, I think, that the current voter roll is, is the best one Pakistan uh, has had. Um, nevertheless, there are still a, a few problems. Well, one of which was that is that the in registering people were asked to identify both their 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 home address and their their work address. They were supposed to indicate which is their preferred voting address. Uh, approximately what ten million people I think failed to do so, or ten percent of the I'm sorry more ten percent of the people on the on the uh, voter registration list failed to do so. And the, the default position was that they would be then registered at their uh, home address. Um, we were uh, talking to a number of people. They expected that that, that will disenfranchise large numbers of people. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. With, with today's announcement of the, the dissolution of parliament, um, the voters list is closed, so there can't be any further changes to it, so whatever problems existed yesterday will exist on election day. Um, there are a couple of other issues that impede voters' access to the, um, to the, the, the polling place that, that have come up but have not really been ad ad adequately addressed. The one, um, the parties had really urged that they be permitted to provide transportation uh, 
to, to voters on election day to the to the polling stations. Um, obviously, in Pakistan, tr uh, public transportation is limited, and, um, and people have difficulty getting access to polls if the election commission uh, cannot provide transportation. Um, the, the, so far, that the, the the party's efforts have been been rejected. Um, you know, th this came up last year in Multan when the by for the by election when the uh, uh, it was it was the seat of the outgoing uh, prime minister, M Mr. Jelani. Um, the election commission determined that they could provide transport to only ten percent. Of the of the people in in Multan, uh, the, the voters, and uh, it was a very hotly contested race, and uh, the the result were, were allegations of, of bias on the part of the election commission that they were uh, trying to uh, depress turnout in the areas where they did not provide transportation, and um, it, the whole issue really backfired, I think, on, on the election commission. Uh, so it's going to be a contentious issue uh, d during the, the, the upcoming election as well, I think. Um, the, well, one of the, the issues that the, the delegation looked at, which is it's not a problem, but really a challenge, and it's the, the, the issue of the, the youth bulge. Um, there's approximately 35% of the registered voters are under the age of 30. Um, it's going to be a challenge, I think, for the political parties to attract these voters and keep them engaged, um, although the viability of certain parties may well depend on it. Um, w w we did see PTI, uh, Imran Khan's party, making a concerted effort to engage youth, although he's not attracting more youth than the other parties are. I think the PPP, actually. Uh, according to the recent polls that have been conducted, uh, actually uh, att attracts more youthful members. Uh, but uh, PTI really, it, it's a big part of PTI's constituency. Probably the, the, is the, 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 the age cohort that is uh, most likely to, uh, is the, the, is larger than any of the other cohorts that uh, support Imran Khan. Um, He's done a pretty good job, I think, of using um, various communication technologies to uh, appeal to them, particularly in urban areas. Um, but it's going to be an interesting sort of development going forward to see what, what youth actually do, because uh, there's clearly a lot of discontent, I think. Uh, and it, it's probably a, a large reason behind Imran Khan's uh, current appeal. Um, there's always an issue in, in Pakistan as to whether the, the losers are going to accept the results. Um, with, with, uh, with, with PTI and Imran Khan, I think it might be a particular issue going forward. The, a number, the early polls had indicated that, that Khan was uh, doing very, very well. And, uh, Recent polls have, have shown him um, with diminishing support in, in the polls. Um, likely on election day, uh, no matter how well he does, there's going to be a, a big discrepancy in the popular vote and the number of seats won. Whether his supporters fully sort of appreciate that the, the nature of a parliamentary system and, and the inevitability of such a discrepancy sort of remains to be seen. A lot of people were, were, were worried about the, the, uh, the react reaction of uh, Imran Khan's supporters if he doesn't do as well as his supporters <laughs> expect that, that he, he will do. Um, and, and one important role of international observers and domestic election monitors in these kinds of elections is w when, they, when they find that the election has been a credible one, uh, the losers, I think, have a, a more difficult time rejecting the results. Uh, of course, we bolster the, the claim of the, of the losers uh, when we find otherwise. The, you know, I guess finally there's the, the role of the, the military. There's 
no dearth of conspiracy theories in Pakistan in regard to what the military might be up to. Uh, one theory that we heard was that uh, the military would, would be uh, uh, behind the selection of, uh, of, of a caretaker. Uh, they would have a candidate in the race to, that, that they would, uh, and they would influence the, the, the outcome of, of the selection process. Um, after the caretaker was selected, they would engineer some sort of crisis, maybe around the delimitation issue in, in Karachi. Uh, claimed that the government can't control the violence and therefore the, the, they would, the, the, with the support of the caretaker, declare a, a, an emergency and postpone the election and wait until a time more favorable uh, for their preferred candidate or party, whoever they might be. Another theory was that the military really didn't want to be too involved and was going to try to influence events at the margin, <laughs> uh, probably help the religious parties, maybe help Imran Khan, uh, and try to maneuver them into a position whereby they can uh, affect the uh, formation of the, the next government. Um, no one thinks, I believe, that the military actually wants to rule directly anytime in, in the near future. Um, whether or not any of these theories turn out to be true, I think is, uh, we'll just have to, have to wait and see. It poses a big challenge for election observation, obviously, because it's difficult for us to detect what the security services or the military might be doing uh, uh, that's all obviously surreptitious. Um, but nevertheless, usually, those kinds of activities are, are eventually revealed. Um, Everybody likes to think of an election as being a critical one or a pivotal one, I think. Um, in, in this case, I think it, it, it truly is a, a very important one because it's going to really determine whether uh, the reforms that began in, in 2008 are going to continue. And the, the, there's a lot of very critical issues that are going to be facing Pakistan over the next several years, in, including the withdrawal of, of U.S. troops from the region and uh, the ability of the next government to, uh, to deal with those issues is going to depend in large part on uh, its legitimacy, and its legitimacy is going to depend on whether it was elected through a credible election process. Um, so we're going to be further engaged. We're going to follow this through to its uh, conclusion and uh, wish the Pakistani people the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Now, Arif? Thank you, Michael. Uh, so my task is to identify uh, wild card factors or you know, X factors that could contribute to a different electoral process and different outcomes. Uh, but before I do that, uh, what I'd like to do is just uh, make some general comments about Pakistan's experience with elections and then identify some constant trends that we've seen in terms of the past few elections and then move on to talking about what might be different. <coughs> so. Just in terms of Pakistan's electoral experience, I think framing is important, just in terms of how we approach the issue. Uh, the tendency is to talk about uh, Pakistan in terms of militancy and the military. So civil-military relations is something that animates much, much of our discussion of Pakistan. The challenge of militancy is something that you know, we shouldn't uh, avoid, but uh, we shouldn't intrude, uh, allow these issues to intrude themselves in terms of a discussion of uh, what is expressly political in Pakistan. And so you know, when we talk about Pakistan's politics, we should also recognize that uh, it doesn't simply just face these challenges that uh, are, exist you know, throughout the Muslim world in terms of 
uh, developing a, a democratic system, consolidating democracy and all that, and also the challenge of, of radical extremism. Pakistan is also very much a part of South Asia. Uh, it's also a former uh, British colony. It's a Commonwealth country. And so those two elements uh, contribute to uh, the political culture there, the style of politics, forms of authority, types of campaigning and all that. And, and those are important factors that should be recognized as well. Um, and you know, we tend to talk about um, Pakistan's feudal lords and uh, depict its political process as something that's unchanging, that uh, there are these cast of characters that have been around since you know, time immemorial, and they, they dominate the political process. And there is validity uh, to, to some of those claims. You know, if you look at, um, you know, the former Prime Minister Yusuf Reza Ghilani, you know, his family had been uh, dominated, that area of Multan, for, for quite some time. And uh, he even recognizes that, you know, he claims, um, you know, a connection to Abdul Qadir al-Ghilani, who is, uh, you know, a, a famous Muslim saint, originated from uh, Baghdad, Iraq, and, uh, you know, purportedly the descendants had come to uh, that part of South Asia. So, you know, that element of continuity in terms of political leadership is something that can't be dismissed. But at the same time, you know, Pakistan has seen multiple waves of change in terms of the political characters inside the country. So in the late 1960s, early 1970s, there was the formation of the Pakistan People's Party. There was the influx of uh, middle class, uh, somewhat, you know, socialist or even radical uh, young politicians who entered this political party. They were displaced a little later. Um, uh, by uh, feudal politicians who Bhutto brought in uh, to make himself more electorally viable. And then in the late 1970s, there was the Pakistan National Alliance, this, a great anti-Bhutto alliance that had a lot of members from uh, the middle class. There were young, um, new entrants into the political process, and many of them are still involved today. <coughs> and in fact, some of them have actually uh, joined the Pakistan People's Party. So it, it, it demonstrates that uh, uh, that level of, of, of um, you know, fluidity in terms of the political process. Uh, and then finally, just in terms of uh, some of the more um, uh, recent elections, if you look at the provincial uh, assembly polls and then the local body polls when they were held, there are new middle class politicians that have come in. They have a greater connectivity to sort of the, you know, the, the average Pakistani, to street politics, and, and that is changing sort of the nature of relation, the relationship between uh, the top and the down in terms of government. So what sort of um, constants have we seen in terms of Pakistani politics in, in, in the past few elections? Um, one is uh, the, and I'll go in a different order, um, one is the power of electables. So um, there are a cast of uh, politicians that uh, appear throughout every election cycle. They don't necessarily um, affiliate with the same party in each election, but because of their own social and economic capital and, and political capital as well, they are able to uh, maneuver and uh, manipulate the political process and maintain uh, um, relevance. And so uh, if, uh, you know, a political, if a politician does not get a ticket from party X, uh, he, will go to party y, he or she will go to party Y and, and um, get a ticket from them. Uh, because it's a, it's a mutually beneficial relationship. That person gets uh, the support of the political party that gives them that edge, uh, adds to their uh, electability, but at the same time, they bring something to the table to the political party. Um, and so uh, we have that factor combined with um, this anti-incumbency. You know, as we see, as we see um, you know, the party that gains the most um, plurality of votes in, in, in Pakistan's recent elections, it's, it's changed. It, uh, there's, in the 1990s, we saw a uh, sort of interchange between the PPP and the PMLN. That cycle was broken with the formation of the PMLQ uh, by Pervez Musharraf. But, uh, and now we're sort of returning back to that PPP-PMLN interchange. Um, so we have, uh, um, you know, the uh, electability factor and uh, the anti-incumbency that produces this interchange, this cycle of A, B, A, B, A, B. And so, um, you know, there is a, a level of continuity in terms of the fa char characters involved, but they sort of uh, play this game of musical chairs. So just in terms of other uh, patterns and trends we see in the past few decades, um, you know, Pakistan has a very polarized electorate. It's, uh, you know, in the United States, we have the red state, blue state divide in Pakistan, 
Uh, it's an entire spectrum of colors. It's a you know, big grand rainbow. rainbow. And so uh, politics is very regionalized. So you know, we tend to talk about things at a national level, but you know, what's happening in, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa is uh, you know, vastly different from what's happening in, in urban Punjab. Um, and so um, you know, all politics is local, and, and, and especially in Pakistan. And so you know, there's, there's a different game going on in Balochistan that is sort of um, uh, resistant to the trends that are happening at the sort of national level that we discuss here and that dominates the discussion in terms of national politics in Pakistan. Um, you know, if you look at um, other constants, we have uh, the PPP, uh, despite, uh, you know, even in times in which it has not performed well electorally. So in the 1997 elections, it was, it was, it, it did really badly. Um, but it still has this, had this base in, in interior Sindh. So over here. So, um, you know, it can, it can rely on that as a sort of its fallback. And um, it, it gives us this sort of minimal threshold of about, you know, 20 percent uh, in terms of uh, the uh, National Assembly seats. Um, and its uh, performance in urban Punjab is increasingly, uh, increasingly dismal, and it seems to have actually given up on it uh, to PTI and PMLN. Um, and, there, and it sort of correlates to this urban-rural divide. So you have the PPP, which uh, dominates in uh, rural areas in terms of southern uh, Punjab and urban Sindh, uh, or interior Sindh. And then the PMLN uh, has a stronghold in, in urban Punjab. And then the MQM also dominates in, in urban Sindh. Uh, and then if you sort of just um, uh, you know, combine a number of political parties and and look at, them, look at them as sort of ideological blocks, uh, there is this uh, kind of uh, center, uh, sorry, left-right divide that is emerging in Pakistan. And uh, if you add up, uh, you know, uh, the seats of, let's say, the PMLQ and the PMLN in the past few elections, because, you know, there is an overlap between the PMLQ and the PMLN. Much of the PMLQ was taken from the PMLN. What we see is actually um, uh, the right, center-right parties and Islamist parties uh, have a, a strong position in Pakistani society in terms of and in, in the po uh, political process. And so they tend to get about, uh, as an aggregate, about 45 percent, at least 45 percent of the seats uh, in parliament. And so, you know, that will factor into the coalition building that will occur after uh, the elections um, later this year or in, in a few months. And so, you know, it could be the case that some, uh, Nawaz Sharif is, is in a way boxed in that uh, even if he wanted to make uh, an alliance with, um, you know, uh, supposedly more progressive parties, that uh, his, his a potential allies could very well be uh, parties like the JUIF, like the JI, and, and, he, and he'll need their support to push himself uh, above or near the 50 percent mark. And then, you know, we, we talk about, um, you know, much of the discussion of the 2008 elections um, uh, in, in the discussion of the 2008 elections, uh, there's often been these references to the PMLQ being, um, you know, thrashed or, or beaten heavily by the PMLN uh, and the PPP. But if you look at the popular vote, the PMLQ actually got more votes than the PMLN, uh, even though uh, it, it got about uh, three-fifths or 60 percent of the total parli parliamentary seats of uh, the PMLN. Um, so it, uh, the PMLN actually beat it in terms of actual electoral seats. But, um, you know, if we look at the, seat, uh, the races in urban Punjab and also throughout the KP province, these were really close races. And um, I would say uh, most of the races, aside for uh, the seats uh, that some uh, ANP bigwigs like Asfandi Arawali ran for, uh, most of those races were won by a margin of between, you know, of less than around 5 to 10 percent. So, you know, assuming, just assuming that, you know, the conditions are, are similar this time around, uh, the elections in many of these races, or most of these races in the urban areas could go, could go any way. So in terms of wild cards, obviously the biggest one uh, seems to be, is uh, the Pakistan Tehreek and Saaf party, Imran Khan's party. So uh, this is a party that is, um, that relies on on a, a number of factors uh, for, um, uh, for its uh, re recent political su success. One is its ability to differentiate s itself from the other political parties. So it is uh, an anti-status quo force. 
and uh, it's tried to differentiate itself from the PMLN, uh, with, it, with, with which it has much in common. So both parties rely on urban support, rely on support of the middle class, and what they're trying to say is that, you know, this is the old and tired model where the voice of change. But, you know, looking at exit polls from uh, 97 and 2002, you know, we saw that uh, Imran Khan uh, was actually, you know, a, a somewhat viable choice for voters then too. But uh, many voters, um, including people who voted for the MQM, saw his party as the sort of second choice. So it begets the question, why didn't they vote for him? Why did they choose the other party? Uh, most probably is the issue of electability. So maybe their hearts were with PTI, but uh, either you know, when they went to the ballot box or even before, they decided that the person that they would vote for is uh, some, you know, the lesser uh, among the remaining quote unquote evils. So um, you know, that could very well uh, replicate itself today that you know, despite uh, PTI's presence in terms of uh, public opinion polls, it um, might not do as well. But you know, the big difference between now and then is that the party has uh, brought in uh, quite a, a large number of so-called electable politicians from other political parties. So we have Javed Hashmi, Shah Mahmood Qureshi, and others who have, have joined the party. Um, but what that does is it waters down, water, water, uh, waters down its ability um, to differentiate itself from the other political parties. So it has to play this balancing act. And the recent intra-party elections that it's conducted allows it to do that because it says, you know, these are autocrat, these are so-called democratic parties, but in reality, in within, they're autocratic. And, and we've conducted this, this clean uh, democratic process. And even if you look at some of its recent TV commercials, you know, they highlight uh, a painter who was uh, elected as their senior vice president in Abdabad. Um, so, you know, they're, they're really, um, you know, emphasizing this message. Sorry. That, um, that they're uh, different from, from the rest of the pack. And, and so what that does is it allows it to challenge um, uh, not just the PMLN in urban Punjab, but also um, uh, the ANP and JUIF in, in, in the KP province. And I think that's where a lot of people are not really paying much attention to. And um, you know, if you look at public opinion in, in, in the KP province, there's a high level of dissatisfaction in, uh, with the governance of the ANP and also with the security situation. And so, um, and there's also a considerable amount of animosity towards the United States uh, and the government's participation with uh, the United States, uh, cooperation with the US in the war on terror. And so those factors contribute Plus, uh, Imran Khan's, you know, uh, being of, you know, Pashtun ethnicity, the, all that combines toward, um, you know, a possible strong showing for uh, PTI in KP. And so, some uh, Pakistani political analysts, in, including uh, Sohail Waraich, who is probably one of the, you know, the best um, Pakistani observers of pa Pakistani politics, um, they think that PTI actually has a, a chance to win a provincial, uh, to actually form the provincial government in KP. So, you know, we tend to look at politics at the national level, but at the provincial level, there are also, you know, there's also uh, other trends that are going on and, and they're quite significant. And so if PTI doesn't do well at a national level, um, or, you know, uh, Imran Khan says we'll, we'll um, you know, do a clean sweep, we'll be able to form a government on, on our own. Now he's kind of backed away from that, hasn't emphasized that in recent months, but you know, those are the expectations of the rank and file. Um, but if they're able, and, and most likely they won't be able to do that, but if they're able to do well in a single province and govern KP, let's say for five years, uh, that will uh, allow them uh, to sort of showcase what they're able to do in, in terms of actual governing and not just giving um, you know, nice PowerPoint presentations with what they which is what they tend to do nowadays, uh, you know, with these big plans for uh, energy reform, for environmental reform, and all that. So, um, you know, even if PTI falls short at the national level, there is a scenario in which it could um, do well uh, in terms of the KP province, and that will give it the necessary momentum uh, to continue into the next election cycle if it actually governs well. <coughs> Peter had um, made some uh, comments about the youth that actually, you know, are consistent with, um, you know, some of my uh, take on this issue. Um, you know, he had mentioned uh, the voter registration levels between, you know, the ages of uh, voters between the ages of uh, 18 and 30, 
Um, uh, you know, actually, if you look at, the, uh, at a bit broader, between the ages of 18 and 35, there are about 47 percent of registered voters. Um, now, much there's not a lot of good data on uh, the political behavior uh, and the political sentiments of Pakistani youth. So, um, you know, we tend to speak of them as a single block, but uh, we tend to not recognize uh, differences between uh, urban uh, youth, <laughs> rural youth. Youth in, uh, let's say, in uh, in KP or Punjab or Karachi, and so you know, if we look at uh, previous uh, exit polls and also some recent surveys, uh, as Peter had noted, there isn't much uh, the uh, the distribution of you know political loyalty or support uh, among the youth is actually consistent with the, the trends in the overall populace. So it, there's not really much indication in terms of the the data that's available that the youth will actually vote in a way that's different uh, from the overall populace. Um, but, um, you know, if we do look at um, the support base for different political parties, as Peter had noted, uh, PTI is, uh, ha its own support base is disproportionately consisted of, of younger people. Uh, and then if you look at look, Nawaz Sharif's party in, in terms of, of voters that are, uh, you know, 70 years and above, uh, you know, he has, or sorry, uh, 65 and above, you know, he has this massive support for them. So, you know, it could suggest that uh, in terms of uh, generationally, that in terms of uh, the urban center-right middle-class voter in Pakistan, uh, that the PMLN uh, is sort of the party of old and the PTI is the party of new. And maybe, um, you know, if the party is able to sort of maintain some momentum as the years go on, you know, that PMLN vote could transition into a PTI vote. But um, it's really unclear as to what the impact would be in the current election cycle. And, you know, for all this talk of uh, Imran Khan being very popular among the youth, you know, according to some surveys, Nawaz Sharif is also quite popular. So uh, JWT, which is a major international advertising company, uh, its uh, Pakistan division uh, did a survey of the youth. They, they framed it as a survey of the youth, but it was actually of the urban youth. And uh, they asked them who their heroes were, or who their role models were. Uh, you know, there were a couple of, it was Shahid Afridi, who was a major cricket star, but also Nawaz Sharif and Imran Khan. So um, it's really unclear as to whether uh, Imran Khan's star power with the youth will actually uh, result in any uh, meaningful electoral impact. Now, uh, given the fact that Imran Khan's uh, support base still is uh, disproportionately consistent of the youth, you know, he, uh, he needs to uh, bring them out uh, to vote. You know, there's a challenge of leveraging or harnessing uh, the political support of youth in every country, um, you know, given their, you know, the lack of uh, the fact that, you know, politics isn't expressly salient for them. Uh, and so uh, PTI has tried to use new media technologies, social media, SMS, um, and television advertising to sort of, uh, you know, to bring out people for mass rallies. And I think they'll also try to do the same to, you know, for these, you know, so uh, basically get out the vote type uh, campaigns. But, um, you know, the, the type of voter uh, that it's really banking on, uh, the young urban middle class Pakistani, is um, essentially uh, a demographic that has been depoliticized over the years. And they've tended to support uh, sort of non-political structures. Um, and so there's that chat. And many of them have been demoralized as a result of uh, the party's declining uh, popularity in the past uh, year or so. And so, you know, the PTI will have to use its, it's going to hold a big rally in Lahore on March 23rd. And so that's going to be probably, you know, a key part of its campaign to sort of reverse the trajectory in which things are going. Um, so just uh, two more wildcard factors that, uh, you know, could play a role in terms of the, the upcoming elections. You know, uh, we tend to talk about this urban-rural divide in Pakistan, but we don't really acknowledge what's in between. So there are these emerging peri-urban centers, um, uh, zones that are sort of adjacent to uh, recognized municipalities that are also urbanizing. So you have, uh, you know, populations developing there, middle classes developing there, groups of traders, uh, and these individuals uh, tend to have a more center-right style of politics. You know, they want um, pro-business policies. Uh, they're also, you know, relatively nationalistic. 
and some of them may have support for some you know religious organizations or even religious parties but the tendency is for them to you know vote for more mainstream uh, center right parties like the PMLN so um, you know these type of changes are happening not just in sort of central Punjab but also in southern Punjab and northern Sindh and you know these are areas where the P, uh, where the um, Pakistan People's Party is dominated and so uh, I'm not quite sure as to whether they'll have an impact in this election cycle. They could tip the balance in, in very close races. Um, and, but I think, you know, in the years to come, as Pakistan urbanizes, you know, currently 65% of its population is rural. But, uh, and I think that data needs to sort of be, um, you know, regrouped in terms of urban, semi-urban, and, and rural. But, uh, you know, as the years go on, um, we could see a change in terms of, you know, potential real challenges to the, um, to the uh, PPP support base in southern Punjab <coughs> and, and uh, in interior Sindh. And then finally, um, you know, there is this issue of violence. And uh, violence not necessarily as, uh, you know, militancy not necessarily as a political force, but as an anti-political force. And, um, you know, the question is whether uh, the violence in Karachi and Balochistan and in Fatah and KP will actually prevent uh, the elections from being held in parts of the country. So in, in 2008, it was quite a violent time in Pakistan. In, in December of 2007, Benazir Bhutto was assassinated, yet the elections continued. Um, and you know, there, you know, perhaps there could be a, you know, a, temp a ceasefire that's negotiated with, um, with uh, groups such as uh, the, the TTP, but, um, you know, as Peter noted, there's a, a change in terms of the type of violence that's happening in Pakistan. And, you know, violence has tended to be instrumental, um, and even in terms of uh, the TTP to, to some extent. Um, but, you know, the um, increased sectarian activity uh, by the LEJ, which is a partner of the TTP, um, you know, suggests that uh, there is, uh, you know, this lack of, there is still an instrumentality, but it's uh, completely disconnected from the system, and in fact, it's motivated around intimidating certain population groups and, um, you know, engaging in some sort of quote-unquote cleansing. So, and, and in Karachi, what we've seen is, uh, you know, a change in the type of violence uh, with each successive year. So, uh, from 2008, you know, 2008, it was uh, <coughs> oriented around uh, two different factions of the MQM, uh, the MQMH and the MQM uh, al -Daf. and then in 2009, it was sort of MQM versus uh, the ANP and, and, and Pashtuns. And, and then as we get, uh, and then uh, there's the emergence of um, militant forces that are tied to the PPP and the Baloch community, the Amman community, uh, Amman community. And now the TTP and the LEJ uh, are a, a, a more predominant force in terms of violence <coughs> in Karachi. So, you know, even in Karachi itself, the largest city in the country, um, there is a, the potential danger that um, elections in some parts of the city, um, it might be difficult to hold elections there. Um, but, you know, with that said, um, you know, there are, are measures that the government can take to kind of give themselves um, safe space to conduct elections in most critical areas and then maybe delay the polls in, in areas um, in, in some more vulnerable parts of the country. But even in, in 2008, uh, there were elections that were held in Balochistan and, you know, participation rate was quite low, so it was probably about, um, you know, 10 to 20 percent, um, but still the elections were held. So um, they might result in, in, in polls that are held in certain uh, dangerous locales, but, uh, you know, the quality of the participation would be quite low. <coughs> and then just uh, some final thoughts. You know, I think the consensus in Pakistan and outside is that uh, the PMLN is uh, sort of, you know, the party to beat and that it's most likely going to form the next coalition government. But, um, you know, if we look at, um, there are a lot of factors involved that could just, you know, produce a different outcome. So, you know, if PTI does really well, it could siphon off a considerable vote, uh, a considerable number of parliamentary seats uh, from uh, the PMLN. While it wouldn't gain a plurality, it would deny the PMLN's ability to either for, uh, gain a plurality itself or uh, and not, uh, gain enough votes uh, to have enough of a lead where they could actually form a coalition government. You know, if we look at the PPP, it's a, it has managed to form a coalition government and, and hold it together since 2008. 
and it's done it with certain characters that um, uh, the PMLN would be unable to ally with. So the PMLQ, in whatever shape or form it exists after 2013, is probably not an entity that uh, uh, the PMLN would make an alliance with. And the MQM, uh, relationship, the relationship between the MQM and the PMLN uh, is, is, is not good, and they've, they've attempted uh, you know, a rapprochement, but um, it, it, just, it just you know, fell apart. So you know, the, P and, and the PMLN uh, and the MQM don't have much they can exchange you know, at the provincial level and, and elsewhere uh, that would make the relationship um, you know, viable. So, uh, you know, there's the issue of, you know, how many votes they get or how many parliamentary seats these parties get, but also what that factor is, how that impacts uh, their ability to form a coalition. So, you know, even if the PPP comes in second, but in a close second, uh, it could um, be better positioned to form an alliance with some of the other political parties. Um, and even once a coalition is formed, you know, it could be a, a very weak coalition. Uh, there, you know, this uh, present coalition Everybody, uh, myself included, you know, thought it wouldn't last longer than a year or two. It's managed to last, and you know, somehow it also included the PMLQ, which was uh, this sort of major adversary of the PPP, and so it's defied all sorts of logic, and it survived. But you know, we shouldn't discount the um, you know the level of uh, political instability that's occurred within uh, this coalition framework. And you know, does uh, somebody like Nawaz Sharif have the capacity? Uh, to, to manage that coalition. Um, you know, he didn't uh, do such a good job in his previous two instances in power, um, but, you know, he's somebody whose outlook on politics has changed as well. So in his years in exile, um, he has uh, become probably one of Pakistan's uh, greatest proponents of civilian democracy, and um, even in terms of his own relationship with the PPP, uh, he's been quite restrained uh, so, uh, to the extent that you know, his critics call his party a friendly opposition. Uh, so you know, there's been change in terms of how um, Nawaz Sharif has approached politics, and maybe that will uh, amplify his abilities to form and, and, and consolidate and, and control a coalition, but um, none of this is guaranteed. And that's it. Thank you. Well, thanks, Arif, and thanks to both of you for two uh, useful presentations to help uh, frame our thinking uh, as we move toward the elections. Let me, uh, and before we open it up to the group, let me just put two uh, questions on the table uh, for the panel. And the first one, uh, I'll let me throw out another potential wild card uh, that was not uh, referred to, and that's the courts, or specifically the Supreme Court. This is an institution that's, of course, been quite activist uh, over the last few years. It effectively removed uh, the last prime minister, and it issued an arrest order for the current one, even though it didn't follow up. Um, so I think it's it's very unlikely that the Supreme Court would actually directly affect these elections, but it. it Con could conceivably play a role, for example, um, if there are uh, disagreements among the different political parties on electing or selecting a caretaker, prime minister. There is a constitutional process to decide that, but there could be um, a situation where there are complaints or cases filed with the Supreme Court, Supreme Court hearings. Um, we know that the Supreme Court isn't, too, or the Supreme Court Chief Justice is not too uh, doesn't really like the PPP party. So my question here is, uh, what ro could, could the Supreme Court uh, play some sort of role in delaying the process, or should we just assume that it'll stay out and that we really shouldn't uh, worry about it in, in that context? And the second question uh, goes back to the issue of voter turnout. Um, I think we all know that there's a tremendous amount of, of cynicism, anger, name your emotion, uh, toward politics, toward the entire political dispensation uh, in, in Pakistan. So I guess, Peter, I would ask you, and, and also Arif, just because you have a, a good pulse on, on the country as well, do people g give the impression that, that they, that they want to vote? Are people scared to vote? Are they apathetic? Are they angry? Voter registration, uh, you know, we heard that it's, it's proceeding well. That's, that's good, but that doesn't necessarily ensure that people will vote. So this is a tough question to pose, but really if, if either of you could just get a sense about what we can expect for turnout, if, there could, if the, the levels could be higher than the last election uh, or not. Well, 
in regard to the, the first question, the Supreme Court recently had an opportunity to postpone the election and declined to do so. So I, I suspect that's not their intention. Um, in regard to the second issue, it, it's really difficult to say. I mean, I, I think we all assume that the high level of violence will have some effect on, on voter turnout. But it's really interesting to talk to the candidates. Uh, and we've been conducting a, a program for uh, youthful um, political campaign managers uh, in uh, throughout the country, really. But I, I was talking to a group of them from <coughs> Peshawar, and um, you know, there were many of them were from parties that have been the specific target of violence, and and to, to sort of witness their enthusiasm and uh, and commitment to uh, seeing the campaign through and doing whatever they could in light of the circumstances, it, it was really quite uh, quite amazing in, in some respects. I don't know whether voters have the same enthusiasm as uh, campaign managers and, and candidates do, um, but I, I, you, you see a certain degree of resilience on the part of the Pakistani people, and you know, they're, they're uh, they're used to this kind of adversity and, and uh, find ways to to uh, adjust to it. Um, so I, I think it will affect turnout, but probably not to the degree that it, it might in other places. Well, in respect to the courts, um, the courts have the Supreme Court has operated within um, some observable constraints, and so. Um, the Supreme Court Chief Justice has been, you know, somebody who's challenged, um, you know, broad elements of power in the military, uh, sorry, in the country. So the military, uh, the executive, the prime minister's office, the president's mm -hmm. office. But at the same time, uh, he sought to not derail the political system. And so I think, uh, you know, as Peter, Peter noted, you know, he, he chose not to intervene, uh, and, uh, you know, earlier this year when he could have uh, derailed the electoral process. But at the same time, he's been pretty persistent in terms of trying to uh, empower the Election Commission or force it to empower itself uh, in terms of vetting candidates, uh, especially those who either do not file their taxes or do not pay their taxes. So, you know, this is sort of um, uh, similar to the role that, you know, um, other third party forces have been trying to play over the years in terms of cleansing the political process in Pakistan and, and taking out more corrupt elements uh, and holding them accountable for their misdeeds. So um, there is this kind of, um, you know, a passive uh, tussle going on between the Election Commission and the Supreme Court on this issue. Um, but I don't think uh, the Chief Justice will act in a way that would, um, you know, result in a delay of the elections. Um, but at the same, and also, you know, the, um, the uh, election commissioner uh, is a, a retired judge, and it seems like uh, they're on, um, you know, they come from a similar vantage point uh, in terms of uh, politics and, and the political system in Pakistan. Uh, and the second question was about, um, oh, yeah. oh, participation, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, voter participation rates in Pakistan average in the, the low 40% 40, 40 range. And, um, you know, I think, <coughs> You know, the best we might see this time uh, it could be, you know, closer to 50 percent. But, um, uh, you know, I think there will be lower participation in some conflict hit areas. Uh, at the same time, I do think that there has been a politicization of a, um, a, an apolitical segment of society, uh, the urban youth. And if you look at, um, you know, the popular media in Pakistan, the television media, newspapers and all that, they're oriented around politics on a regular basis. Politics has, in fact, become almost a form of entertainment. And uh, so, you know, the primetime talk shows are widely watched and, um, you know, everybody watches them across age groups. And so there is this uh, heightened level of political consciousness and an appreciation for politics itself. And, um, you know, the military as a sort of, you know, playing this intermittent political role, uh, you know, um, a desire for that is kind of subsided. So, you know, that could result in greater electoral participation, um, but, you know, it relies on a lot of the, the parties that um, 
uh, are dependent on uh, bringing out new voters to really get out the vote. So uh, it's also dependent on, on these party machines. Hmm. Thank you. Okay, let's turn things over to all of you. Um, if you could uh, uh, ask your question, uh, well, it should be one question you should ask. Please keep it brief, and if you could give your name and affiliation, that would be great, too. We are webcasting, which means uh, we need to make sure people around the world can hear your questions, so please wait until uh, the microphone is handed to you. So let's start right uh, here. Yeah, the gentleman right here, yeah. Yeah, I don't see too much uh, in the past three, five years. I haven't seen too much um, uh, disputation between the various parties on legislative issues. So even in terms of constitutional amendments, um, the voting is relatively unanimous, even though the negotiation par process might be, you know, stretched out. But they have d uh, demonstrated an unprecedented unpre capacity to uh, develop, uh, come to decisions on the basis of consensus and doing it in an institutionalized framework, in a parliamentary framework, through these various committees uh, that have been formed since uh, 2010. Uh, so I think that uh, type of change in, in the political culture will continue, and that will mitigate any sort of uh, potential risk that is associated with this kind of divided uh, political framework. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, Pakistan Tehrik and Saab, the PTI party, is, um, you know, <coughs> focused on sort of um, uh, trying to change the sy system and, um, you know, it really does not have that experience of, uh, you know, from that pi past five years or even before of, uh, of playing this sort of good role within a parliamentary framework and it requires a lot of compromise, but the problem is that its own political messaging, uh, its own uh, reason for political existence is based on the assumption that everybody else has got it wrong. Um, so, you know, uh, depending on how uh, its level of, uh, you know, its presence in parliament, it, it might even be boxed in to play this uh, hyper-antagonistic role, and so that could factor in, into the next National Assembly and its ability to, uh, to get legislative business done. Yeah, take a question in the back, the woman in the green. Yeah, right in front of you, Shioko. Thanks. The, the situation in Baluchistan is really kind of interesting. The, it poses a, 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 an issue for the selection of the, the uh, caretaker uh, chief minister. The, with the, the selection process is supposed to be a consensual one, one in which uh, the various parties get together and, and collaborate. In the case of Baluchistan, there is no opposition, so there is no one to collaborate with. Um, it, it, it's been raised by the people that are that, that have boycotted the election and are kind of outside the process. They're saying, "Well, what's going on here? 
whatever caretaker emerges from uh, this process is not going to be uh, the product of a, of a genuine consultation. Okay, the gentleman uh, in the back right there, yeah. First of all, let me thank both of you for, uh, for your interesting observations. Uh, I have a question for Aris, and I have a, uh, another question for Peter, but they're going to be short. Uh, my question for Aris is, you talked about wild cards. As you pointed out just before, <coughs> it's too early in the game. But you know, uh, I think uh, your observations are very clear going in. The two wild cards that I wanted to ask you about that you didn't mention, but that's not, not a deflection or a criticism. One is the guy called Tayyip Kadri, mm -hmm. which is very important. So how his impact is going to be in this whole election and how he may impact. The other is, of course, the role of the media, how they're going to play into the whole thing. So before you answer that question, my uh, question is Peter. Uh, as Peter, thank you again. You are with the NBI. And what I'm going to say is basically not a criticism of you. Uh, I think you had some clear observations about Pakistan and how the energy, what are the issues to look for. My question to you is, and I'm looking for it uh, in a philosophical way, why do you call it Pakistan? Because if you are an expert on a subject, it would be nice to at least talk to people who don't know about the country the right pronunciation. So I was really struck by the fact that you call it Pakistan, but you're willing, so it's, it may sound minor to you, but I think as an expert, I would think, what do you think? Is it right to call it by its proper pronunciation as people would like it to be called, or you want to insist on, on your own pronunciation? Uh, again, it was not a criticism. Uh, it's kind of, uh, okay. I think that uh, Peter and you could perhaps discuss that afterward. Okay. Uh, it's somewhat of a subjective issue. Uh, thank you. Uh, your first question was about Tahir al-Qadri. Um, I, I don't think he's going to be a significant force. He's already uh, pretty much spent. Um, he uh, was somebody who uh, came back to Pakistan in um, you know, mysterious circumstances, and I think that fed into a lot of conspiracy theories. Uh, my own belief is that he's somebody who leveraged uh, his own uh, support within the Pakistani diaspora. And so, you know, he has a lot of followers in Britain, in Canada, and even the United States. Um, and their money goes a long way in terms of organizing um, events in Pakistan. It's actually not that expensive to do television advertising, newspaper advertising, and even holding political rallies in terms of, you know, Western money. In terms of Pakistani money, you know, they see it in rupees, and it, everything's pretty much a million there now, you know, uh, because of the uh, devaluation. Right. So, um, you know, and because of circumstantial, um, you know, developments, they thought that uh, he was tied to the military or to the judiciary. Um, but, you know, I think events have proven that, you know, he came on his own and, and doesn't have much exter uh, any significant third party force backing. And uh, he also doesn't have too much backing um, outside of his own, um, you know, religious organization. So um, he pretty much, his opportunity came earlier in the year, and, and he missed it. And so now um, he's somebody, even if you, you know, he made a statement the other day that um, if uh, something happen, doesn't happen in Pakistan, that the country will fall apart. And it wasn't on the first page. It was on the, um, like, the 20th page of the news, uh, a leading English language newspaper. It was on the cover of its Karachi section, the Karachi metro section. So and that's an indicator of, uh, where he's gone in terms of, um, you know, in terms of, you know, public recognition and all that. And then the second question was on, the media. oh, media. And so, you know, the media um, has played this interesting role in terms of Pakistani politics in the past, you know, five to ten years. It has uh, supported the democratic process, but it has also uh, sought to hold uh, the politicians accountable um, on some issues. It has sided with the military, um, and we're talking about the media as an aggregate. You know, let's say on issues uh, relating to relations with the U.S. and all that. Um, but I think what it will, the role it will play is that it will, um, you know, enhance uh, public interest and appreciation for the political process, 
and it's uh, going to be a big event for them. So they're all competing against each other. They want people to watch them, and so they're going to give minute-to-minute -minute coverage. Um, and just like CNN and all these different channels here experiment with new technologies, the different whiteboard, the boards, and all that. They did that in, in 2008, and they're going to do that again in 2013. So even in terms of their own material interests, you know, the media is a sort of, you know, uh, a, um, a block in Pakistan that has its own uh, self-identity and vision for the country um, and its own corporate are identity. We, are, are they aligned with each one or the other? Like, you know, we have the Fox, and then we have the CNN here. Uh, yeah, there, there is the bias. Yeah, the yeah, in yeah. That context. Yeah, there's bias. There is a rela there are relationships between um, those who uh, own different uh, media conglomerates and different po po politicians. Um, you know, we even saw that with Malik Riaz. You know, with the phone calls and all that. Um, so um, it's um, you know it's the same thing that goes on here. I think where uh, the politics and the media converge and business interests converge, and um, so you know the Jung Group which had an adversarial relationship with Noah Sharif in the late 1990s, is now quite positive towards him. Uh, I'm, I don't have any explanation for that, but it's just um, you know, an observation. So there is some fluidity that exists as well, I think. And so it's probably more fluid than, let's say, what we have here in the United States, where you know, Fox News is a, uh, is a veritable arm of, it's a, you know, paraphrase Mike Mullen, is a veritable arm <laughs> of the Republican Party. So. All right, next question, let's move to the front of the room up here to, actually, I guess we could take these two questions together, Bill and then uh, Arnie. Thank you. Bill Milam from the Wilson Center. Um, I suppose this is to Arif. Uh, speaking of mysterious returns, we keep reading that President General Musharraf is going back to be involved in the election. Now, this will be a short answer, but uh, do you see any impact from that? No. <laughs> I didn't think so. Uh, second question, uh, and this is hypothetical. Uh, suppose that the LEJ announced that it was going to kill every Shia who turned out for the election or who they had found out had turned out for the election. Uh, do we know how they vote enough to think that would make a difference? Uh, how does Shia vote? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, there isn't uh, a single way that, you know, Shias vote across the country, but, you know, if we look at things at a sort of more, you know, regional or localized level, in southern Punjab, for example, um, uh, Shia Muslims tend to support the Pakistan People's Party, and at the same time, um, you know, uh, the Sunnis, uh, particularly from the middle class, tend to support uh, the PMLN or even the PMLQ. Um, and so that's what... Yeah, in southern Punjab. Uh, and so that's why, um, you know, some political parties have made alliances with, um, you know, groups that are seen as the political front of the LEJ. At the same time, um, you know, the PMLN is one party that's been accused of doing that. At the same time, it just brought in uh, Waqas Akram, who was a member of the PMLQ, uh, is sort of somebody that is hated by the um, LEJ's political front. In fact, if you follow their Twitter feed, they attack him, like, on a regular basis. So, um, you know, it's, uh, so, you know, things can be quite fluid, um, so it might, uh, I think it will have an impact on the political process, and in southern Punjab, um, you know, it could uh, push things in the end league's favor, but at the same time, um, you know, they have made some decisions in terms of bringing in new political talent that uh, would make that, um, you know, framework a little more complicated. Uh. My name is Arnold Zeitlin, and uh, I've been following Pakistani affairs since I opened the first Associated Press Bureau there in 1969. Uh, you just touched on something I wanted to ask about uh, very briefly, but um, what in what to what extent, if any, are the mainstream parties courting the extremist groups uh, in the hope of getting their support? Well, um, you know, in terms of the Lashkar Jangvi, its political front, the Ahle Sunnat Wal Jamaat Party, and the uh, Sipai Sahab of Pakistan, they, you know, they, they get banned and they make new names, so uh, it's tough to kind of follow, uh, keep track of it all. But um, so we have that factor where the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, the PMLN, has been, um, you know, it's reported to have an electoral alliance with them, but they denied it. Um, but then the Ahle Sunnat Wal Jamaat came back. 
and um, noted uh, the alliances that it's made with other parties, including the PPP. So, um, you know, all politics is local. So um, I would not necessarily view, you know, the PMLN or any other party's relationship with some of these groups as reflecting, um, you know, their vision for Pakistan at a national level. But uh, at a local level, um, you know, it's, it's not a, you know, the best analogy, but it's, you know, like Chicago politics, you, you deal with the devils on the ground, you have to. Um, and so, um, you know, Nawaz Sharif, for example, is not, uh, you know, comes from a Barelvi ba background, so he's not somebody who has this reflexive animosity towards Shias. So his own religious sentiment wouldn't, uh, you know, result in, you know, type, wouldn't indicate any type of association with extremist groups. Uh, then there are these other, um, you know, uh, softer type of relationships with some of the um, um, extremist outfits, mainly for the sake of self-preservation. So, you know, we see parties like the JUIF and PMLN and others were identified by the TTP as groups that they would negotiate with um, uh, to negotiate a deal with the military, a peace agreement. Um, and, you know, a lot of these parties are forced and these politicians are forced to uh, give, ra you know, payments to um, you know, they're extorted and they have to pay the different terrorist groups for protection um, and, you know, uh, you know, they could sort of negotiate, um, you know, sort of informal peace deals on their own with some of these groups uh, to give them safe space. Um, but, you know, a lot of this happens within, you know, it's reported within the realm of rumor. So I wouldn't be able to speak about it with any meaningful specificity, I think. Yes, question of the woman in the orange. Hi, um, my name is Karen Hirschfeld. I'm with USAID. Uh, I'm just wondering about the possibility and likelihood of Southern Punjab um, seceding and becoming its own province. Oh, uh, well, there is a proposal. Uh, the PPP has sort of initiated the idea of creating new provinces out of Punjab, and um, it's uh, proposed this idea of the Southern Punjab Bahawalpur province. So they would sort of mishmash two entities. Um, that are part of the South, their stronghold, and then take that away from the PMLN because the PMLN uh, dominates in northern Punjab and southern Punjab, uh, sorry, central Punjab. And so basically uh, it would, one, appreciate uh, the sentiments on the ground for more autonomy or uh, provincial selfhood, and at the same time it would get a new province that it could, it could govern. Um, so um, I, I think, you know, they they proposed legislation um, before this current parliament was dissolved, and it's obviously not going to go anywhere. Um, so nothing's going to happen in the next few months. It's going to be an issue that's going to be um, probably you know, on the legislative agenda once the next parliament comes in. Um, but I think the uh, provincial assembly actually has to approve it. So you know, are you going to, uh, you know, how many uh, people from the PMLN are going to approve, uh, you know, uh, a proposal that's going to be against their own party, uh, party's interests. So uh, there is going to, you know, they could, uh, I think the PMLN has proposed uh, creating two or three additional provinces instead of just one, and it makes more sense uh, given the geography. Uh, so that might be a compromise they could, uh, could deal with. Okay. Yeah, just wait for the microphone. <laughs> Thanks. I just, just, I just want to, you know, um, point out that in Pakistan, um, Peter pointed out that there's a transportation issue that's not true. I was born in the village, actually, very backward village uh, in very close to travel area in Pakistan. So what happened in Pakistan when you conduct election, the election centers are in primary elementary schools. So they are in within walking distance, one or two mile. And another point is if uh, Pakistani have to uh, elect a government based on issues, uh, you guys missed that point. Uh, it's going to be two issues more important. One is the drone strikes. Whoever stand up against the drone strikes will have definitely a lot of, you know, um, uh, sport. And the second issue is the uh, energy issue because Pakistanis are really uh, suffering a lot and their industry is kind of diminishing because of industry, uh, uh, we call it load shedding, power outage. So those are actually two major issues that people have to really look into it or, and, and decide who should they vote for. Thanks. Thank you. I think there was a question on the other side of the room over here. If I'm not, yes, right in the front here. Uh, maybe two yeah. possibly linked questions. One, 
I have two possibly linked questions. Uh, first, uh, let's assume that uh, the election goes off pretty well. Uh, what sort of positive impact do you think it has uh, post-election, and how long would that be sustained? And sort of linked to that question is one of sort of an exogenous factor here, which is uh, Pakistan's uh, current economic situation and uh, you know, the potential of, of another balance of payments crisis, which could happen possibly during the caretaker government or uh, immediately after the election. And sort of what kind of scenarios do you see there? Thanks. You give me the tough one. Oh, yeah. um, but by the election going well, you mean? People broadly consider it to be credible, the, the losing parties accept the results. I mean, I think that the, it's a positive uh, development. I, I mean, I, I, I think that makes it more likely that the, the reform process will continue. And the longer you keep the military out of politics, the, the better. Um, the, The degree of cooperation that we've seen among the parties, I think, is largely a result of their having a, a common cause. They want to sustain civilian governance. Um, and that I think that will keep them together if they all get something out of the electoral process. A strength of the Pakistani system is that the People could, you know, even if Nawaz loses, he still has the Punjab. And that's true of all the, you know, the other parties. They could lose at the national level, uh, but still maintain a, a base at the, at the local level. I think that keeps them in the game. I mean, they, they have a, an incentive to, to continue to, to move forward. Um, in regard to the economic issue, I, don't, I really don't know, Joe. I mean, I'm not sure I can, I can tell you. I mean, obviously, that could be very disruptive. I mean, the, the, every, every government in Pakistan, in pa Pakistan is a coalition government. Uh, nobody's ever going to get a majority, at least in the foreseeable future. And so the question is always regarding the fragility of that coalition. Um, an economic crisis is going to obviously affect the ability of who's ever in power to, to hold that that coalition together. So, you know, you, you, you're likely to see, you know, people bolting and, uh, and uh, choosing another coalition partner. So governments might fall. That would be sort of the, the, the history of that kind of thing, I think, around the world. Yeah. Well, um, you know, if the elections uh, are free and fair and the uh, results are accepted, you know, it's an important milestone in Pakistan's history. and. Uh, you know, brings the process of democratization a step further. But then I also think, you know, five years down the road or even a few years down the road, um, whether, you know, if the next government is especially a weak coalition um, or an unfragile coalition, you know, if it fails on, you know, your, as, you know, in respect to your second question on these major economic reform issues, um, then, you know, public faith in the democratic process um, could, uh, you know, could just fall apart. Um, you know, they tried the PPP and um, it, which has been successful in terms of political reform and things like that, but uh, in respect to the economy, its performance has been abysmal. Um, and the PMLN has a much better economic team, a much more competent set of um, politicians that are electable, but also can, you know, manage a, a portfolio. Um, and not let the you know the company, uh, country go bankrupt, um, uh, you know, it, uh, without economic sanctions. So the late '90s were an exception, I think. But um, you know, but if they fail at that, then you know the public will say, uh, you know, the the narrative will be that, look, it's just like the 1990s. We had them both, we gave them both a shot, and they failed. Now we're looking for something else. And you know, it could be Imran Khan's party. So it could be within a democratic framework, um, or it could be you know, the next army chief. Um, so um, a lot of things are, it's still up in the air, but, you know, there is a decent chance, you know, now more than ever, 
that um, these elections could facilitate, you know, move the, you know, the, the bus of democracy or the democratic bus or whatever you want to call it forward. Well, it's always nice to end on a positive note, especially when it comes to Pakistan. So uh, if you could join me in a round of applause for our two speakers. Thank you to the two of you, and thank you all, and we are adjourned.